welcome to pediatric nursing. You know, you guys have gone through a lot just to get to here. And next semester, you know, is capstone for many of you. So this is that semester where I'm gonna try to make you think. I'm gonna try to make you as I do um, the way I teach to make you look at it and say, okay, what is that word? What does it mean? What do I have to look for? How do I treat it? And how do I know it worked? And I'm gonna be doing that um, throughout the semester. My name is Betty Bogart. I've talked to some of you earlier when you came on earlier. I actually started out teaching at Cutler Bay on ground. I had pediatrics, I did pharmacology, and I even did one semester of community because they needed someone. So I just did it. So I've actually, what you're going through right now, I understand because I've taught it before. Now, pediatric nursing is not an easy course. And it's like a med surge too, but for kids. And I sort of know where they overlap, the med surge too, and pediatrics. And I'm gonna try to bring some of those diseases that you're like, I just don't get it. I'm gonna try to make it very simple for you. The way I describe things are simplistic. I'm gonna give you examples of, I can't even tell you how many kids that I've had in my career, you know, and try to bring you those examples, which students have told me really help you remember, because now I've given you something to look at, okay? So tonight, I'm going to be going over the orientation PowerPoint. I'm going to go over it pretty uh, quickly because you have two online and both of them, you're going to be hearing the same information. I do follow by the book. And the one thing you need to know about me is you need to communicate. If you can't get something done, you can't come to class. You can't do something. You need to tell me before it happens. I can work with you, but if you don't talk, you shut down, I can't help you, okay? So always remember, I'm extremely approachable. I know life shows up, okay? I'm a part of that life showing up, you know? So please let me know what's going on. I will work with you. And there are times where I've told students, you are not taking this exam today. We'll do it at the end of the week. You're not, no. You're not mentally ready. And a couple of days later, they're like, thank you so much. You're absolutely right. So just let me know what's going on. I will work with you. So we'll do that orientation PowerPoint. I really follow those rules. I will go into this week's PowerPoint, which I've given you this information. And if we have time, I do have a cahoots. <clears throat> let me tell you about my cahoots. I take them, change them, mold them. I make these questions up myself. And I base these questions on quizzes, exams, HESIs, and NCLEX. And when I look at the results of last semester, I'll see where weaknesses are of students globally. And there's 16 campuses that I am, I look over, I am the lead pediatric professor. And I look at all the campuses and I say, you guys didn't really understand about, let's say hemophilia. I'll make sure I put extra questions in the codes. And I describe as I'm going through the codes. I'm not just gonna read la, 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 and answers are A, B, C, D. That's not gonna teach you. I'm gonna tell you as I'm reading the question, how to break it down, what to look at, what does that mean? What are the things you need to know? And then you'll be able to get the answers from there. And this is how I start you to think. So every week I do have a cahoots and I do renew them all the time. I'd spend a lot of time doing that to make sure that you are getting those concepts that you do need so that you can understand to be successful. My HESI scores globally are well over 900 mean which means most students do very well. If you do what I tell you, okay? You need to pay attention in class and you need to look at those cahoots, take them seriously because it's exactly what you've been just taught. And then after class, because the next week is gonna be the, exam, the quiz on 
this week's information. It's next week's quiz. Take those cahoots seriously. Look at them. You don't understand concepts. Go back to the book and read it. Okay? I've had students who said they've gone to the book. They've gone to all these nursing YouTube channels. Whatever works for you. You got to put some time into it. I can't spoon feed you, but I can give you what's there. You have to understand that, okay? Now, my door is always open, which means if you need extra, you're not understanding, please, I will work on your schedule to try to meet you in order for us to get together and do a quick tutoring. Now, I'm not going to keep you an hour, two hours. Your time is too precious. I will keep you as long as you need. Another thing I will tell you, if you don't understand dosage calculation, I'm the person, okay? I can teach you in 30 minutes how to do mics per kilo per minute. And you're gonna go, gee, that's easy. Why hasn't it always been like that? Now, I will send you a um, recording that I have. It's like a year and a half old now, but, and I look different, but and of course the hair always changes. You know, I am a woman. So, but the content, I'll send you the three worksheets that go with it, and I will send you this recording. I also have one that I did for PNs, but it's the same stuff. I mean, RN, PN, math, you still got to give meds, right? It's a little shorter, and I have another handout for that. So you're going to get all this stuff to work with. And if you still don't understand, come to me. I had three students last semester on their first exam, got all five math questions wrong. On their third exam, they got them all right. And why? They kept coming and coming, coming to me. So if you're that person, I wouldn't give up those 10 points. I wouldn't give up two points on math. It's hard enough passing the content, right? So let's go ahead and let's get started. Any questions, anybody so far? All right, let's just start. Oh, with... sorry, Professor. I did have a question because sure. on the syllabus, it doesn't mention anything about um the quizzes. The syllabus? Yes. Okay. <laughs> quizzes are given, and let me give you the exact. They are given next week. Week two, week three, week five week six and week eight. Now, I'll always mention it in class like I did today um, when we're going to get started on the PowerPoint. There's a discussion question that's due. By Wednesday, you open it up. And by Sunday, two peer responses. Be careful. It is a two-part. What about who are you? Why do you want to be a nurse? You know, the normal question. But there's a little bit more on nutrition and how it affects the cognitive development of children. And you're gonna get a little bit of that in lecture tonight, okay? So you'll be able to do that. Quiz one is next week at the beginning of class. If you look at the announcements that I wrote, it is there. And it's on this week's information. As I said, the PowerPoint, your codes, you'll have all the questions there if you go back and you look at it. So all of this good stuff, rules, regulations, what do you need to know about online? <clears throat> well, online is, you know, if I'm standing on a podium or I'm standing behind a camera on Zoom, it's still, I'm teaching you. Um, you're coming to class, I'm gonna give you a PowerPoint, I'm gonna to lecture to you. I'm gonna make fun with the cahoots. Let's go to see who's gonna win this week. Um, and then answering questions all along. I have found students who hated peds, scared of peds, are gonna be working pediatrics. By the end of the semester, they're like, oh my God, this is gonna be fun. Now, who do you contact? Any problems, the first thing you need to do is contact me. I am your, the instructor for this course, but I'm also the lead pediatric uh, professor of the RN and the PN programs. So anything peds, it's all me, okay? Now, what if you don't like what I tell you? Or what if I don't answer you quick enough? I encourage you, please 
get a hold of Dean Brown. And if you look at the bottom here, it's the, the email is darlene.brown. It's just not an initial, uh, like some are. And there's her phone number. And she, she don't sleep. She's always answering the phone. Now, she lives in Phoenix. So she's three hours earlier than us. She answers phone calls from people here at seven in the morning, which is four in the morning there. I don't think she sleeps, okay? Um, and she's really concerned with you getting your best education uh, as possible. And the one thing she wants to hear is, you contacted me first before something happened and she will work with you, okay? Very important thing with her. So can't get a hold of me, get a hold of Dean Brown. Now, one of the things that is going to go on, you're going to have problems with the internet went out. Um, you're going to have, maybe there was a storm and the electricity went out or life showed up, the internet was turned off. All of these uh, things happen. If this is going on, let me know so I can work with you on all of your assignments. That's what I want to know all about. When you want to communicate with me, Always do it through Canvas. Send me a message, send me email. I do answer pretty quick because I have the email on my phone. So I'm, and it's always next to me. Everybody's phone's always next to them, right? I mean, what, we, what if we miss something? Oh my goodness. I remember not having cell phones. And I'm like, how did we live without these things? Now, if you need an answer quickly, let's say it, I know you all, most of you had three courses. You have community, you have peds, and you have med surge too. You're gonna get crazy, crazy busy. Let's say you're in that hour or two that you have to study peds and you just don't get it. Something's happening, you don't understand. Text me, okay? Or call me and I'll answer the phone for those emergent type things. And this is like, oh my God, I'm gonna have a heart attack if I don't know now, okay? If not, put it in a message and I don't wait 24 hours. Um, as long as I'm awake, I'll answer stuff. Sometimes I'm up till 10, 11. Sometimes I'm in bed at eight. Who knows? Depends on my day. You know, I'm an old lady now. So some days I need to bed earlier and sometimes I'm not. So just please message me and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. You know, and this netiquette, etiquette, make sure you come to um, class. You're not in your jammies. You're not laying in bed. You cannot be in a car, even if you're not driving, because it can interfere with the driver. And this is from the dean. It's just for your safety. Um, I don't care if you wear your Ford shirt. Just wear something that's not everything hanging out type stuff. Okay? Be respectful of that. And these don't use all capital letters. Um, don't yell at me, okay? I'm a nice person. Please don't yell at me and I won't yell at you, okay? And that's a deal. Make sure you come at time. I'm usually here like 15, 10 to 15 minutes earlier. If you need me earlier than that, because you need questions before, let's say a quiz is coming up and you don't understand, just send me a message. I'll come on early, I'll help you. If you want me to stay over later, let me know, I'll stay over later. Just let me know. Now, one of the things you have to do is get attendance. And it's not all the Zoom that I'm telling you about, making sure that your names are correct. It's also by when you enter something into Canvas, um, in Canvas. So we have this, this week you have to have two points of entry. Well, you've done the uh, beginning uh, about um, start uh, the, the course, all of those things. And you also have your discussion question, which the first one's on Wednesday by midnight and the second one is by Sunday. Something happens tomorrow, you can't get to it, send me a message. Professor, my daughter got sick. I had to go to the doctor. I couldn't get to it, blah, 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 whatever. Let me know before it's due and I can help you. And we'll let you go till Sunday to get it all done. But again, just let me know. I've put all the due dates in the syllabus. They should all be there. Any questions, just let me know, okay? Because the syllabus is, you know, the thing that we do follow. Now, I do follow the late work policy. So discussion question is due by Sunday. 
If you don't get it in by Sunday and you haven't told me something's going on, you have till the following week to hand it in, but it will be minus 10%. Let's say you were put in the hospital. That's a valid excuse. With documentation, I can let you do it and get no 10% off, okay? So always get me some sort of documentation. One of the things about online is it's just not showing up to class, as I said. It's going into Canvas and points of entry where you either put the discussion questions or you go in and you do a case study or a CJ Sims or something. Those are all points of entry. And we need, as I said, two in a week. Now, if you just all of a sudden don't put anything in there for two weeks, they can literally drop you out of the class and they don't have to notify you. Now, if I see that you're getting to that point, I will be sending you a message. And that's what I'm telling you. Do something, put something in. You are at risk, okay? I do do attendance every day immediately after class. So you are um, in class at eight o'clock. They say at 8.01, I have to get you minus 15 minutes. 8.31, again, 15 minutes. So make sure that you're here on time and you stay till the end. Now, I do have a question for all of you, and this is a night class. I sort of understand what your question, your answers will be, but I can go directly straight through the whole class and I will get you out earlier than 1030. Or I could give you a break for 20 minutes in the middle. What do you want? Do you want a break or just get her done? Uh, depends on the day, but usually just get it over with. I agree. I agree as well. Yeah, I agree. Done. Get her done. I agree. Okay, not a problem. There's one class that might run longer, and I'll tell you it's week five, only because of the content of that class. But besides that, I'm done. I'm done on time. Usually by 10 o'clock, we'll be out of here. So I want you to know that my goal isn't to keep you here to the last minute. Um, now, if you have to get up and go to the bathroom, you're thirsty, you need to get something to drink, very politely get up, do what you need to do and come back, okay? I understand you got to go to the bathroom and you get thirsty or you're hungry. It is okay. I don't mind you eating. Um, just be respectful. Don't sit there and just, you know, be, you know, slobbery, I guess. So anyway, all right, attendance. Very important. Now, Two days missed classes can put you at 20% of your attendance missed. And according to a lot of accreditation bodies, if you don't get that certain amount of attendance, you um, are not getting what you need. And it's not what the requirements are. So they will drop you a letter grade. And they started doing that last semester. Now, what if you are not um, coming to class because your car broke down. You uh, were stuck in, um, you had an accident. You had to go to the ER. Your mother got sick, something. I've even had electric gone out where I've had students get from their um, apartment associations a note that said the electric went out or from the electric company saying that, yes, the electric was out for this time. Or maybe they send you those texts that say the power's out till this date time. Those things will cover you when you're missing attendance due to those reasons. So even if you have to be late or even if you have to miss a course, some of them are explainable, okay? So just to let you know, if you do get 20%, they will bring it down a full letter. So make sure that if you are going to be calling in sick, make sure that you have something to cover it. Because I would hate anybody who worked so hard and then, you know, with a letter grade drop, you fail the course. That would be horrible. Um, and you will get notifications, things going on. And this is when I ask you, send me documentation, give me something, what do you have, okay? 
Now, how to be successful, I, I've told you already what to do. Make sure you come, you listen, those cahoots, partake in them, take notes on them, you know, go home, you know, after, go home after and look at them, look at the cahoots, look at the information, look at the book, see, all right, what else didn't I get there? And you guys will do really, really well um, as long as you keep up with it, okay? When you come in for your quizzes, I told you how to do it. We look at the PowerPoint. Some students hear my voice in their sleep because I do have a YouTube channel and you can listen to my recordings as much as you want. And if you wanted to listen to last semester's recording, but last semester's recording, or you wanna to listen to this week's before you come, you can do that. You have um, a year and a half of recordings there. So you can pick and choose whatever you want, okay? So you've got all those things to be successful. Make sure you, you know, do something to keep yourself organized. Now, I'm a person like things written. Um, you know, I keep track of things and I've got, you know, these things on every class and all of the weeks and attendance and things that I need to do and check. And I keep checked that way. Your uh, assignments, please try to do the same thing. I will send you reminders um, when it's getting there, but you know, maybe you, know, you slipped through the cracks and I didn't get you that week. I, I hate those things to happen. Just you know, try to keep organized. This is the biggest thing with online, to keep organized. Make sure you have my number posted somewhere. In fact, all of you pick up your phones and dial me in now. My, my telephone number is 305-951-8055. It is in my biography. It's everywhere. You know, I, you can get a hold of me. Sometimes your internet goes out and just text me. My internet went out. I don't know what's going on. Okay. As long as I know what's going on with you, all right? Make sure you follow that syllabus. Make sure that you know you look at your books. Now, we are all on digital books now, but I know some of you probably have some books from previous students. Make sure they're the correct edition. Um, the one that's the biggest uh, concern that has been happening is that Calculate with Confidence book. We just left the seventh edition last year. We're on the eighth edition and um, they still haven't changed it within my uh, the modules yet. So I'll be sending you out a different worksheet and assignment for you all for that when you get up to it. And that's on week nine. But I'll be sending that to you early so that you do have those things. Just make sure you get that. Any problems, you see, sometimes you don't see. Um, there are only two case studies this semester. It's the uh, ass assignment exam and the practice exam. If you don't see the numbers going over into the grade book, they should automatically. If they don't, let me know. There's something I can do or look, or if I tell you, just send out a help ticket, okay? I am here to do whatever you need, whatever tutoring you want, okay? All you have to do is ask. If there's a group of three of you wanna come to discuss every week, whatever time, I have no problem with that. Let me know. Now, I do a review before every exam. I also have a really good HESI Q&A, as I call it, um, open forum that I do before the HESI, where the students say they could hear my voice during the HESI and they knew the answers because of the way I explain things. Um, this semester, um, that week, I actually, on week 10, which is uh, an exam. And it's also um, the week I do the HESI review. Um, I'm actually going to Mexico. My daughter's getting married in Tulum. So I will be giving class that week, but I'm gonna be doing a HESI review a week early on that previous Sunday. So instead of doing it week 11, I'm gonna do it week 10. But that just gives you more time to listen to it over and over again. So you guys don't miss anything from me for it. So actually I was glad to take this class instead of a Friday class that they gave, they, they switched us all up. So anyway, 
you want to review, you need tutoring, if you don't do well in the first exam, or you did really great, but you wanted to know those three questions you got wrong, just ask me. I don't mind. I'll tell you what those concepts were that you missed. So grading is an 80-20, like most courses are, which means 80% are key graded assessments, assignments. And that is your exams, your quizzes, and your HESI. And altogether, you must get a 78.0. Once you get a 78.0, we will add in your homework. I will caution you, homework can fail you. We had several pediatric fails due to homework not done. So make sure you do your homework. And I will send you messages if you're not getting it done. The big one is the pediatric assessment project. And that is due September 3rd, I believe. And um, it's three components and it's 6% of your grade. Now, I tell students this just for you you will see that it's going to get pretty hairy at the end of the semester. You're going to have projects due for community and for me. You can do mine early if you want, okay? And if you want to do that, let me know. Just go to week nine, look at what it encompasses. You don't get it. You don't understand it. Come to class early or stay over late. I'll describe it to you. And the other thing I do is if you hand it in early and I see there's some things that could be improved to improve your grade, I give you the opportunity to improve your grades. So you can get 100 on it. Okay, you just have, this is what you need to do. You do it. It's in before um, the due date. You're, gonna, you're golden and you can get 100 even after three tries, okay? Because I believe this is a learning experience. It's just not one and done. This is something that you can learn because many of you, especially in Miami, are gonna be going on for your BSNs minimum because look at Baptist healthcare system. They want BSNs. And I know that, I live here. Um, I actually went back to school because I sort of saw something going on and I could see I was going to need higher level degrees. Now, did I need a PhD? <laughs> no, but I couldn't stop, you know, so I just kept going on into school. I'm a Barry grad, so um, that's where I did my final and the rest I did University of Phoenix and I really enjoyed their program. Now, homework assignments, and what is this? Well, I turn on the homework assignments on week six, and that shows you how it affects your grades. And then on week eight, because that's the week that you could drop, right? So you could see them both together. I turn them back off, which means you're only on your key graded assignments, your exams, your quizzes, and your, your HESI at that point, but you don't have a HESI yet. So that'll give you some ways to do decisions and it shows you how it does affect you, okay? And that's why we do that. I already said all that. Ex uh, anybody who needs accommodations and has a letter, I need that ASAP. I will give you those extended times on quizzes and on the exams. I'll make sure that Dr. Brown has his information to make sure that you're getting the extra time that you do need. I have to put it in for the quizzes. So let me know as soon as we can. So uh, if not, you're only going to get 10 questions, a minute and a half per question. It is 15 minutes total. OK, and then it turns off. If something happens in the middle of a quiz and your computer dies, text me immediately, okay? That's why you put that phone number right there in your phones, okay? That would be a case, and it, it has happened. Exams, the same thing. I've had students in the middle of a thunderstorm, their computers went out. So again, exams, um, we'll be going over. It's the same routine. You come in, we'll be on Zoom. There's a certain uh, thing we have to go through to make sure that everything around your desk is you know, in good order. Um, and then after the exam, I can't give grades until everybody's tested. And the last RN test at eight o'clock on Friday night. So 
you will be getting your grades on Saturday. Now, I do know some of you have these moments. I can't wait Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Oh my God, I need to know. I could give you an up or down and that's all I can say. How does that sound? At least it's something. And if anybody gets a hundred, I always let them know because I think you should know. That's just amazing stuff. <clears throat> Exams are one attempt. Again, anything happens, stop. We can pick it up from where it stopped, okay? So just please um, and make sure I know immediately. Now, some of you have had surgery scheduled or things happen, you can't take an exam. Again, tell me before the exam and I can make sure um, that we schedule another day for you. You won't get a minus 10% with that documentation, okay? Um, they can be proctored on campus. I know uh, Professor Hernandez does it a lot for Cutler Bay. Um, and we've got good communication. She has to email me and then I can make sure she has access code if we're good, if you wanna be doing that. Some students just like to be in a quieter place, not at home, there's kids, et cetera, et cetera. So um, just let me know um, what you wanna do with that. Again, anytime exams aren't done on that day, you will have seven days to get it done. Unless again, you're in a hospital extenuating circumstances and I have documentation. This is all the stuff we do for exams. It's nothing unlike maternity last semester. You know, I'll be checking IDs, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure you all have a whiteboard to do your uh, calculations on. You know, the dollar stores have them down here, easy. Or get a gallon Ziploc baggie and a dry erase marker and put a piece of paper in that baggie and you could write it and just wipe it off. It could be as simple as that. Don't go nuts, all right? So there's ways to do it very easily. Again, you don't get your exams done, you will get a zero. Um, and again, always, always, and I can't tell you this enough, contact me before things happen, okay? Before, if you need anything. Homework assignments, again, make sure they're given on time. If they're not on time, it'll be in minus 10%, unless you've contacted me and let me know what's going on. After that second week, I cannot accept anything. So don't think all of a sudden I'll accept all NCLEX at the end of the um, semester. I can't. I can accept them, uh, let's say if they're due on week five. I can accept them up through week six on that Sunday night. That's it, no more. Again, unless there's extenuating circumstances that I have documentation and I know about. And clicks questions, you can do them over and over and over and over and over again until you get the grade you want. Make sure you follow what the modules tell you to mark for those questions. Be careful, the first week is on growth and development at week three one, okay? It's not just beads, it's growth and development, and it is a separate section on your NCLEX and the Saunders, okay? Just to let you know. I need a proper handout. Don't give me that little green square. I can't accept that. It must be the whole running outline, okay? because I need to look at what questions, et cetera, that you have done. So again, we know NCLEX questions are 50 points. You can get as many as you want um, and you can do it as many times, get the best questions. CJ Sims has been introduced this semester. Um, I know there's gonna be lots of questions from, from me and from you. Um, I know, um, Professor Hernandez on campus has also been to these trainings with me. Um, make sure that we get them done. They're, they're great. They're getting you ready for your NCLEX. It's an evolving case studies, okay? So we'll be working with that together. Questions, just let me know, okay? And we can work on it. I already told you about the RN practice and assessment um, exams, their case studies, go through the modules, okay? 
one attempt only, one attempt. You cannot redo them. And the score should populate. All right, what else we got? Discussion posts and your papers must be done in a format of APA. Now, I read your discussion questions. I tell you where you're faulting. If you don't get a perfect 20 points on it, um, it could be that you didn't cite in the body of the paragraph. What does that mean? Well, I'll show you an example. Remember, you do have your LRC, the library person, um, I've actually spoken, I believe it's a guy is at your campus now, if I'm not mistaken, or it could be another campus, I'm not sure, a newer person. Well, anyway, um, go to them, they'll teach you. Remember, there's also many type of programs on the internet. Purdue OWL is a great one where you can put things in and it could give you your references and everything in APA format. Try to do your best, again, remember, I'm trying to get you ready for your BSNs because I know most of you have to. Always follow your rubrics. Try to use newer sort of information um, and um, make sure that you put in the references and the citations, okay? Quizzes will be done right through your modules. You click on quiz one, it'll open up there. Again, it is, 15 minutes, I do them at the beginning of the class. What I will tell you is we'll come in, we'll have an announcement. I will say, okay, you can start quiz one, come back at 8.30. So you get a little bit of break on quiz days, okay? Where you do your quiz and then, you know, say you have to quick get something to eat, whatever. You usually have time that day. Um, and you get your grades right away. You'll see them populate for you. Anyone who wants to know about the quiz questions, concepts, et cetera, I can't give them out till after the week is done, but I'm more than willing to go over that with you too. Again, any technical issues, your computer, the screen goes black, it dies, you don't have a, a co um, the charging cord. I've heard a dog ate it. I mean, I've heard so many things. Just let me know when it happens, stop. Don't try to re-go again. All right, I can redo quizzes, I can redo exams, I can redo anything. But um, make sure if you do have some sort of documentation of what went on, um, that I get it, so that I do know. Your HESI is going to be given on campus. You'll see those schedules come out, usually uh, by the mid-semester. Um, sometimes I even go in and proctor them. So who knows, you might even see me, you never know. I'm always showing up here and there. Uh, it is 20% of your grade. As I told you, I've worked hard with all of my cahoots and my PowerPoints. They're all going to get you ready for your HESI. So if you are, if you're going over this week by week, you guys are going to ace the HESI, but you've got to put the work into it, all right? Remediation must be done. Once remediation is done, I will be putting your grades into the grade book. And then when everybody's remediation is done, usually it's Tuesday of week 12, I will be turning on the homework grades and you'll get your final grades. And, and you'll know because I'll send you a message. And that's all about I have to say with that. Any questions? We're good so far. I didn't put you to sleep yet. All right. Wake up. All right, here we go. Let's get to our PowerPoint. I like to get your homework stuff in. I like to um, have any sort of PowerPoint. I like to get them in by at least Saturday of the week before. Anna, did you put your hand up? Yes, Professor. I was wondering, um, I mean, I know you talk about that, but I, I wasn't, you know, I did not understand. You said that we can um, submit the homework in advance, like we don't have to go by week. We can do, I mean, we can do week two and week three. Can we do that? Okay, be careful. Remember, you have to have contact in Canvas two times every week. Sometimes when you work ahead like that, and I leave it open so you can get to it, save it and enter it on that week to make sure that you do have those contacts in Canvas because they can just drop you, all right? 
You okay. will see, I don't have open dates. I only have due dates and until, which gives you that extra week. I do not have, like for your NCLEX questions, discussion questions, they're open for you. So you can work ahead, but be careful. Right, we can work ahead, but we have to make sure that we come every week at least, tw at least twice so we don't get dropped. There you go, absolutely. Yes. Gotcha. Thank you. No, you're welcome. It's a great question because a lot of students do like to do that. So pediatrics, you know, one of the things the government does, it likes to look at different areas, the elderly, the homelessness, uh, children is one of them. And they're um, now on healthy people 2030. You know, when I first started back to school, I did never heard of this thing. Healthy people, huh? I don't know. And it was 2010. So it's been a while since I've been looking at this. And there's goals. And what they try to do is get children healthier. And the things that I see is a lot of preventative medicines being done. We're just not treating a disease you get. We're trying to prevent you from getting the disease, whether it's de like dental health, you know, making sure that the child knows how to brush, the parent knows, et cetera, so they don't end up with, you know, losing their teeth and gingivitis and all of those things, right? So that's what basically all of these things are. I mean, some of the big things that we do see today is obesity, type 2 diabetes in children. I mean, uh, you guys, for instance, you are uh, very busy. Many of you work and you work overtime. You're in school full time and you have a family, a house, children, and you know, you're busy. So it's easy sometimes just to go through fast foods and give foods that is easy and quick to prepare. I mean, macaroni and cheese is a mainstay, right? So these sort of things, can uh, lead to obesity. It's nobody's fault. It's just the way the environment is today. You know, children got to eat. You got to give them something. Um, but it's, you know, cooking a real meal is hard unless you have, like me, a boiler around, the nana, you know, taking care of those children, getting them good, healthy snacks that they, they should be getting. I mean, my, my grandson just ate a whole big salad, loved it. I mean, he couldn't, that was his first thing he went for. So, but because he has a boiler in his life, right? Children and childhood injuries. I mean, kids do always get hurt, no matter what you do. You put helmets on their head and they scratch their knees, you know, break their ankles. It's just part of it. Violence, uh, whether it is between two adults, a kid gets involved, between kids, bullying, all of that. Vaping, you know, when it first came out, I mean, real bad epidemic, and they realized that vaping really is not good for your lungs. And believe it or not, children have a lot of mental health problems. I've seen some things with young six and seven year old children that you're like, wow, you didn't know that it was there. I mean, pictures tell a thousand words, right? So we have you know, going to suffocate um, guns. Oh, there's something here. Let me see what it is. Oh, it was a toy gun. Pow, it worked. Drowning. I mean, look at us. South Florida. I've seen quite a few drownings in my life. My grandson at age two could swim without floaties, but he would never go in the pool without asking me first because of the amount of drownings. But not every parent understands that, right? I have an older brother who has a big as a child pulled down off the stove, greased down the front of his arms, and he has still the skin contractures and stuff, you know, for 60 years, all right? And it's because of that, um, having the handle the wrong way. I mean, but there were seven kids in our house, so. And then of course, getting into medications. I think the biggest one I see is children getting into vitamins, because they taste good, right? Flintstone chewables, they're really good. Or even Tylenol and Motrin chewables, they like them. Now, the vitamins are not bad. Now, Tylenol is toxic to the liver, so it can be. So who are the biggest children at risk? Well, the premature, 
the very low birth weight and low birth weight children. Those children are born, their lungs, their intestines, their central nervous system, they're all extremely immature. And then they're born outside of the body. So it's really hard to get them caught up. So you'll see them with you know, chronic lung conditions. Kids that go to daycare, and every kid's got to go to daycare if you got to work, right? I mean, I call daycare the area where the kids swap spit all day long, right? One toy to the next to the next, in my mouth, into theirs. And they're always looking and kissing all over each other. I mean, that's what kids do. It's good and it's bad. They're getting exposed to it, so they're building up immunities, but they're sick every week in daycare, right? Children who live in poverty, uh, homelessness, uh, there's a lot more than you really realize. Uh, working in uh, Nicholas Children's ER for the last 10 years of my career, I saw quite a bit of it. Um, and they're not getting proper nutrition, health care, um, sleep, just proper sleep, brushing their teeth. I mean, all of these things. Immigrant families, the Mexicans that come out of Homestead are, when they come in with a kid, I'm scared. Those kids are sick because they've gone to the little clinic or the, the person who's like the health care provider of the group of them. And by the time they get to me, they are sick as sick can be. Um, and I feel bad because they're afraid I'm going to throw them back to their country. And that's not my job as a nurse. My job is to take care of the kids, you know, and to get them healthy again. But they don't know that. As I said, psychiatric medical disabilities, you know, these kids born uh, premature, they've had hypoxic episodes, they have cerebral palsy, they've got all these disabilities and those barriers. How about that homeless person or that uh, migrant worker? They don't have cars, they don't have transportation, they don't have money. They can't even give a $5 deductible to doctors, some of them. So all of these things are real. Now, infant mortality, you know, this is something the World Health Organization looks at. And believe it or not, we're not at the top of the list of doing good. We're somewhere close to the bottom. Well, there's a lot more the United States can do. Uh, it lags quite a bit. They say neonatal mortality, that's when they're under one month old. And then postnatal, which is that one month to 12 months old, this is the highest level of um, uh, deaths that we will see during the first year of life. And we know the smaller the child at birth, the more chances of issues that they could die. Now, as they get older, it's not as bad. Um, but then when it gets to childhood, um, these school age, these children have the lowest, they're understanding more. Um, they've gotten through those beginning uh, years of things that can happen. Um, and then we get to adolescence. And now they know everything, right? Adolescents want to go and they want to be adults. So they're doing crazy things. They're getting injured. Um, motor vehicle is number one of all injuries, whether in the car or ran over by the car. And then adolescents driving the car. Uh, biggest thing for injuries. And we know adolescents' big thing is body image. You know, they're worried about fitting in and being cute and too skinny, too fat, too many pimples, whatever. And it can get to the point of committing suicide. So adolescents have that increase. You know, and then of course, there's other things that have increased morbidity that I've got over homeless, poverty, low birth weight. Um, sometimes those foreign adopted children, they come over with things that we don't know about. And again, children in daycare because they keep getting these things. Now, pediatric nursing is just not taking care of a kid. It's taking care of a family. And many nurses don't go into pediatrics because they don't want to deal with mommy and daddy, especially some mommies. They're pretty rough, you know, and I don't look at it as they're really rough. These are mothers that I need to empower to, for them to help me take care of that child. They're my best ears and eyes, aren't they? They can tell me if I teach them what to look for, they're going to help me. If they have certain procedures that need to be done, 
I'm going to teach them and they're going to do it for me after I make sure they can. So it's the way that you look at it. Now, what is a family? A family is whatever they say it is. You know, my grandson was born in my home with my husband and me. The daddy ended up whatever. And so my daughter was here and the baby was born. He is a part of this extended family. He's always at my house. He was here to the age of three. Thank goodness my, my daughter met a wonderful man, uh, a Cuban man. And it's three years later. And he's taken this kid and, and has adopted him as his own. And now has the normal looking. Is that normal? Is it the extended? Is it nuclear? Is it what? It is whatever they say it is. That is what the family is. And that family is the only constant in a child's life, especially the young children, right? That's the constant. So as a nurse, let me tell you, you're going to be a counselor, a psychologist. You're going to be there between the child and the mother and the father, especially in an extremely ill kid. You're going to see these parents um, go through so much trauma and you're going to be there to help them, guide them through it, teach them um, about the health, how to prevent them from getting injuries you know, and how to keep them well. It's all just part of what a nurse does, you know, and we do it through, you know, many different ways. So the things about children is, have you ever had a kid who's afraid of a needle? No pinche, mommy, no pinche, no pinche. I can't even tell you how many times I heard that as a nurse, which means no shot. No, I don't want a needle. No, no, no. Well, Part of my dissertation was on school-age children's attitude and behavior towards injections. And what I found is there are some children who are afraid and some who are not. And it was the approach on how that they weren't afraid. Um, today, at Nicholas Children, they believe in the comfort theorists. They believe in children's need comfort. And I developed a program still at Nicholas Children's Hospital called Huggies, H period, U period, G period, Huggies, right? Help us give great injections efficiently and safely. And what I promote is that a parent holds their child before, during, and after an injection so they're safe. Now, I'm still going to have another nurse to hold a leg, an arm, or whatever I need to to keep it safe, but that child had less fear, less stress, and less pain as evidenced by less crying. And they still using that today. So this is all about what we do in pediatrics. Adramatic care. Make sure that we are not giving a lot of distress and stress and minimize that physical discomfort. So social, cultural, religious influences. You know, you don't think about that, do you? Like, how is that going to affect? Well, as I said, there's all sorts of family. It doesn't matter. It is family is whatever a family says. Um, we know that as a nurse, we know that the family is going to have that person in charge. And there's going to be the other ones that follow suit. And we need to sort of figure that out so that we can teach and give what they need uh, for each family. Now, many times we have to be aware of their cultural and religious influences. For instance, if you have a child of uh, some of the, like um, from Vietnam, for instance, you can't touch these child's head or they're not gonna look you in the eyes. They're always gonna look down and you don't understand. These are all things for respect. So I hug and kiss them, everybody. Well, I've learned that there's some you can't. Some religions, the father is the one in control, but you can't look them in the eye and you have to give them their space you can't touch. And this is learn understanding all about the culture and the, the religious part of it. 
So a frequent health problem of migrant children and adolescents in the United States is what? This is, you know, migrant, people from out of the country. Diabetes. TB. It's TB. B. And it's TB. You know, we've eradicated it because we're testing for it all the time, right? But other countries, they're not as. And it's actually what we really need to be concerned about. So again, let's keep going into cultural things. Now, we know um, there are certain things. Now, my husband happens to be Jamaican. This man believes in teas and garlic and ginger and honey and all of these things. You get cold. These are things that you drink and it's going to help you. There are certain rituals and prayers that some, you know, cultures go through. Um, we know that sometimes it's putting on a certain cloth or, I mean, um, all of these sort of health sort of things, you know, we could consider them herbal, you know, help. Um, some people call them medicines, but one of the things is we have to know all those things that goes in their body because there can be a lot of um, into, uh, contraindications. Now, how many of you say if you go out in the rain and get wet hair, you're going to get sick if you go inside? Or if you just took a shower, you can't go outside because you have wet hair. You're going to get sick, right? Or how about Abuela saying, put some socks on that kid. They're going to get sick. They can't walk on a cold floor. And how about they got a fever? You got to wrap them up in a blanket, cut them really tight, put a hat on, and you know, booties. And you got to keep them warm. Now, these are all cultural things that I had to learn. So how did I work through that? Well, so I say, for instance, the big one is the hot and cold and um, children coming in with fevers, whether it's a viral or whatever it is, a fever makes you feel horrible. And the only reason why we take town all Motrin is because you feel horrible with a fever. It doesn't really do anything. It just gives that child a moment of, the fever's down, I feel better, I'm gonna drink more liquids, and that's what you wanna do for it. Another thing is, if they're wrapped up, I mean, I call them the burritos, fiebre muy alta. I mean, this is one of the things that I heard repeatedly. And here is this little one-year-old wrapped up and I can't tell you how many clothes on. And I have to tell, and it's usually either the mother or her mother come in and 16 other people because their poor little child is sick. And number one, you gotta find out who's mom, right? And then, okay, and that's grandma. I mean, we know grandma, abuela, has a big to-do with the family unit and everybody's gonna listen to her. It's just part of what it is. So I have to take Abuela aside and say, you know, grandma, I said, I know you love your baby. I, I get that. I said, but your baby has a fever. I said, how is the fever gonna get out and go away? I said, if you cover that baby up, what's gonna happen to the fever? It's just gonna get higher. So let's take some clothes off. How about, all right, are you comfortable? Is it cold here for you? All right, you can put one more shirt on that child. Now, are you hot? Well, the baby's hot too. Another thing, the older kids walking around. I said, your baby has a fever. Now you've taken some of the clothes off. We're giving the child a Motrin and we're giving those cool liquids because that helps bring that fever down and they feel better. And then they'll eat your soup when you cook it, right? Very important that they eat that chicken soup, right? I said, that cold floor is pulling fever out of their feet. So again, you are taking the fever away. Now, how many cultures did I just describe right here and how I dealt with it and what was my goal to make that child feel better? And walking on a cold floor is absolutely great for a fever. You know, taking clothes off as long as they're not, you know, naked. I mean, they have a shirt on, but they don't need socks. They don't need hats. They don't need gloves. They don't need four overalls on. And they just don't need all that. And describing it in that manner, that child's going to feel better. All right, religious. Jehovah's Witness. 
This is one thing that I've had to work with. Now, one of the other areas that is actually my favorite at Nicholas Children is a cardiac intensive care unit. I opened up that unit when Dr. Redmond Burke came back in 1995, and I worked there for over 10 years. Um, absolutely love, love, love the unit. Now, we know usually cardiac children are congenital. They're born with it. They're babies. Because of that and the surgeries they need, they're not making enough blood to keep up with the surgeries, the labs, et cetera, and they require transfusions. Even premature babies in the newborn ICU when I was working in there five years before that, okay? So we have to give blood. Now, a Jehovah Witness mother, father will say, no, you can't. Well, when the child gets in danger, we can go and give it to our risk department and they will get a court order and we can give blood. Now, I will never wave a bag of blood in front of a parent. I will never let it lay it out so they can see it. I used to work a lot of night shifts. I love night shifts. I'm more autonomous. It was a great place for me to be. I could play at night because all the bosses were gone. And, and I love that. So I would tell the parent, call me back at midnight. I will give this when you go and call me back and I'll tell you how it went. So I did it all when they weren't there. Now, I've also worked day shift and I had to give blood. How did I do it? Well, I spoke to the parent, honestly. Did I understand that you don't want to give blood? You know, you don't have to explain to me, but you understand the baby needs it. So I'm going to have you step outside and I'm going to take care of what I need to do. And then you can come back in. And the mother was so grateful. And I had pulled even the bag I hid in a drawer the tubing and the pump, I had it covered with a baby blanket. And I would just look underneath and look at the IV site and make sure it was okay. She never had to see any part of it. So I respected her wishes, but I got the child what they need. I can't tell you how many baptisms I've done on sick, especially those cardiac ICU. I've had all sorts of religions come in and do baptism. And absolutely, you need to give those parents those opportunities because it's what they believe in. You don't have to believe in it, but you need the opportunity for those children. And as I said, we are the counselors. I mean, I've had so many divorces with mothers and fathers uh, because of these illnesses. And, you know, you're sort of stuck in the middle. You know, did he come in today? And what time did he get here? And what time did he leave? I'm like, I, I don't know, mom. I, I'm not going to get into all those times and whatever. You know, and just be there. Just be a listening person. So leading cause of death of African American boys. What would you think? Sickle cell? Firearms. Firearms. Oh. They're just, you know, they they get into it. Firearms and injuries. Again, you talk about motor vehicles will always be there. All right, development. We start from a fetus, we end up an old person. I'm right? sorry. What was that? The answer of the <laughs> firearms. Fire? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, growth and development. Let's think about the first year of life. If any of you have children or have been around children. They're born, they're seven pounds, and they can't even lift their head up. By the time they're a year old, they've tripled their birth weight, and they're walking and running around, and they're saying, mama, da, 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 mama, mama, mama. Isn't that amazing? And it's what I call this interrelated, simultaneous, ongoing type of thing. They get taller, they get bigger, they do all these fine and gross motor skills. And next week, we're going to go into a lot of what all that's all about. But just think about that amazing thing, what they do the first year. So there are things and terms that we do use. You know, we talk about 
uh, stages of development is like the task they can do. Can they have a, a palmer grasp or a pincer grasp or can they put blocks or can they take things in and out of containers? These are all things that we look at. We look at the way that they're grown, they're taller. Um, we're talking about rolling over, then walk creeping and walking. These are all things that we will monitor and look at. And if we are seeing those types of things, you know, where they're not where they should be, then it's something that we need to investigate. Um, children are beautiful. They're unique and special. They catch up so quick. And we will do that by early intervention. I mean, if you're in Cutler Bay, you're going to be going to, um, to the, the PPAC. Um, where I love that place. Um, you're going to be seeing children that you expected nothing from, and they're going to be remarkable. I mean, Patches is an amazing place, and they're still calling me to hire me, um, but I love to teach, so you guys are lucky, so I'll keep here teaching for y'all, but um, you're going to be seeing them looking, and it's a great place to look at those developmental trends, seeing if they're turning over, using their hands and pincers, and, you know, can they button shirts, can they hop, can they skip, can they jump, all of these things are amazing, and remember, no kids, two kids are ever alike. You can have one kid who was walking at seven months old in the house and the next kid walking at 15 months. And you know something? They're both the same. They're both as smart. It's just they both needed their take their time. I did send you a vital sign sheet. And the reason why I sent that is, is because vital signs are not just 60 to 100 pulse like an adult. You're going to see brand new neonates, heart rate, 140 to 160 at sleep. Okay, normal, normal. And the reason why you need to know heart rates, well, well let me give you a great example. You need to give digoxin, which, you know, you have to count for an apical pulse for one minute. Well, if you count it and it's 90 on a newborn, what do you do? Well, that's bradycardic for a new, newborn uh, baby in the first you know, month of life. So knowing these vital signs are very important. What are the respiratory rates? What are the vital signs? And as we go further, I'm going to teach you more about that. But just keep your mind open, okay? So their metabolism, you know, there. They require food, but they got tiny little bodies and stomachs, right? So uh, we need to make sure that they're fed well. Nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. You'll hear me say that oh, at least 28 times during this, this semester. Temperature, when they're born, they have no thermal regulation. They need to be put under a heated warmer and wrapped up in blankets. You know, they've got all this extra body fat that's there um, that it doesn't get warm. They need a lot of sleep, right? Hopefully they sleep all night long. As a newborn, usually it's all day long and awake all night because they want to mess around with mommy, right? Mommy not going to get sleep, but they need a lot of sleep and rest. And the one thing about nutrition, what is it? Nutrition is the fuel that feeds the car. And nutrition is what gives that child what it needs to for the central nervous system to grow, for the lungs to become more mature, for the GI tract to become mature, so that they can move their muscles, so they can lift their heads and turn from the belly to the back and the back to the belly and get up and crawl and creep and walk. You don't give them fuel they don't have the cognition and they're they're not going to be where they should be and remember there's all types of kids you know the kids that are easy uh, i just had a brand new grandson um the end of last month i was in north florida my son had his third boy and that is the easiest kid i have ever seen i slept in the room next to the baby I never heard him cry. That, it was an amazing baby. And she says he still is. You know, there are babies who cry all night long, right? Uh, and you're not going to get sleep. So there's all different children, all temperaments. 
and it doesn't matter, you know, boy, girl, it, it's um, amazing. Now, I did send you a handout on theorists. I'm going to warn you, you're going to see a lot of stuff on theorists. You're going to see a lot with Erickson, Piaget, and Kohlberg. Those three things you see a lot of. And next week, we're going to get really deep down and dirty on them. Um, it's what does this stuff mean? You know, Erickson is all about, you know, um, being able to, to uh, do things, um, be able to trust, being able to um, go and try stuff. Piaget is about figuring things out. I shook a rattle and I like that. That's really cool. You know, or I put my finger in my mouth and, oh, that tastes good. It really is stress. And then Kohlberg's all about right and wrong and the consequences for him. Now, Freud is all about oral, anal, phallic. It's all about uh, same sex peers, all of these things. We're going to get into that, you know, as we keep going. Erickson um, is all about uh, trusting mom. Um, when I cry, mommy comes. So I have trust. Mistrust is they don't come. And we're going to go into all of these more next week. Please look at that worksheet before you come because we're going to get down on it really hard. And these words here don't make any sense to me. So I'm going to make it easier for you. Piaget, there's different stages and it's all about understanding. It's putting up to the point where um, you learn something and then you practice what you learn. And then in formal operations, you know, think about those adolescents. They can figure out 10 different ways why and how they deserve to go out Friday night when they got an F on their exam. But I did this and I did this. And if I do this and that, mommy's going to let me go, right? I can figure it out. And that's, you know, the adolescence. But we're going to go over all the other stuff in between. Cognitive development. We know that these children from the get-go what does a baby do first thing? They cry. Hi, I'm here. And then as they are just laying there, you hear them coo, right? So language, they know that the adults do respond to it. Um, and it's a way that they communicate and it's the way that interaction starts. Kohlberg, as I said, right and wrong and the consequence for each. And it starts out just knowing right for wrong. And it gets to the point where I know right, I know wrong, but I got to do wrong. And I know this is going to happen, but I got to do it because that's just what, the way it has to be. You know, it's like manipulating. That's good old Kohlberg. Okay, play. You ever think about play as something important with children? I mean, what do kids do all the time from the moment they wake up? They're playing with something. They're coloring, they're drawing, they're with their trucks, their blocks. Oh, give them a tablet and they'll go to town, right? My grandson's on my cell phone right now. He can work that phone better than I can. He's like, here, there, there, I'll show you how to do that. I mean, how do these, they, they are born with an understanding of it, you know, and that's part of play now. We're going to name some of the plays. There is social effective with people, sense pleasures like texture of sand. I like what that feels like. Skill, maybe building a puzzle um, by themselves with other children. Um, and it could be pretend. I mean, how many times a kid's in the corner with a truck and let's say a Superman and he's, you know, talking to the Superman in the truck and by themselves. It's all pretend. It's what kids do. This is part of their cognitive development. This is learning. Sensor or in a mortar. That's a really hard word for me. Basically, it's all about what does it feel like? In the mouth, everything. Infants explore the world through their mouths. Even toddlers, preschoolers, everything. Would you get that out of your mouth? Or taking their shirts and putting them up in their mouths. I mean, all of this in the mouths. And it's all because it feels good because they explore the world with their mouths, okay? And it starts them learning, putting them in rooms with other kids, being able to socialize, 
they're getting creative by, you know, when they put their toys down. You know, Christian, my grandson, likes little matchbox cars. The way he lines them up in colors and types of cars and he draw, you know, running through them with another car. It's all being creative, being aware, and, you know, um, again, understanding even morality. You know, they, as a toddler, they're going to understand if you don't feel good, they're going to want to kiss the boo-boo, make it better, right? That's what those little kids do. Now, these are the type of plays you're going to see questions on right here. Onlooker play, you're just watching. Solitary, I'm playing alone. Parallel play is your toddlers. They're in a room with toys. They're not sharing the toys, but they're both playing with toys next to each other. They're not involved with each other. Associative play, now they're involved with each other, but there's nothing, there's not an end to it. It's not like the end of a board game. Okay, I win, I got the king. It's not like that. They play with each other, same toys. You know, they're talking, but there's not a goal. Cooperative play is your older kids. There's a goal, whether it's building a sandcastle and putting the flag on top when they're done or playing a board game like checkers. You know, that's playing together two or more kids and that there is a goal, somebody wins. <clears throat> and kids love to win. Toys are great. They bring parents together. Toys are great because they make the kid work. That pushing, that pulling, that's good for their muscles, their nervous system, right? Getting them up and moving. And developmental assessments. This is all part of that fine motor, gross motor. This is trying to get these kids um, seeing where they are, making sure they're where they should be. And again, if they're not where they should be, let's do that early intervention. You're going to go see speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy. They do things that you don't even think about. And as I said, these kids, kids are special. Even kids with severe CP, they're doing more than you ever thought they could. So when you see Jonathan in the wheelchair, just tell him Professor Bogart sends him a hug and a kiss because um, he's always been my favorite there. My mom, I might even show up there. You never know. You never know with me. So what do we do with kids? So there's certain things that we're going to be doing. There are procedures we look at and we've got to take in count sometimes for disabilities. Like that little girl on the left, she has cerebral palsy, you can tell. So she might have a different set of things that she should achieve and there are guidelines for that. Children can be born with many different things. They can be that cleft lip, uh, cleft palate is a big one. Uh, with extra digits, lack of digits, lack of arm, lack of leg, or it could be a syndrome. Um, and you always think of Downs, right? There's all sorts of genetic um, conditions. You know, I didn't realize how many conditions and genetics there are. I mean, we always think Downs, right? But there's so much more. There is the George. There is Breeder Willie. There, and I could go on. There's hundreds. Do I know all of them? No. But every time I heard a different one, I look it up because I want to know what is that? Because what if I treated them, gave them something that could hurt them, right? I mean, one of the things was um, not getting it's a G6P something syndrome, and it's all about giving them sugar. And sugar could cause cell hemolysis and could cause a heart attack. So giving them just regular Motrin ibuprofen could have hurt them. So looking things up is important. So always, if you don't know something, look it up. I ask the parent. Usually the parent on the older kids will let me know what's going on. We know things can be caused by all different stuff. Um, it could be caused by the mother's ingestion of stuff. It could be, you know, check, you know, German measles, right? You know, thank goodness for all these immunizations today. It could be that PKU. That's why we do those little circles at birth, right? We're looking for that. And then like the genetics, the 22 pair of chromosomes, 
Q22 deletion syndrome is the George syndrome. And I know exactly what I'm going to see in that kid because of what it says. And that helps me with my care of them. Again, the nurses, you know, what are we going to do? Well, number one, you got to get on the level of the child. That means don't sit above them, sit below them or equal. Get on their level developmentally. And I'm not talking baby talk. You don't have to talk baby talk to these kids. They're smarter than you can really realize. But, you know, start to say, so where's your nose? And they'll show your nose. Or I go, oh, what cute shirt you have on. What, what princess is that, you know? And these children will warm up to you. And then when you have to give medicines or do vital signs, let them touch and feel the equipment. And it's going to help. But it is a skill to get on those children's levels. So one of these things here is uh, a father tells a nurse that his child's filling up the house with collections, seashells, bottle caps, baseball cards, and pennies. This is part of what? Now, here is your answers here in the end. Now, all of these things are topics that you need to understand. Object permanence. So how many times do you see an infant go looking for the rattle even though she can't see it? It's not in sight. It's underneath or behind uh, the teddy bear on the floor this, during tummy time, right? They still look for it. So even if they can't see it and they've seen it before, they know it's there. The one-year-old, you put the truck away when they go to bed. When you wake up in the morning, they go right out and go to the toy box and pull it out, right? Object permanence. They still know it's there. Then you have pre-operational, concrete operational, you know, and then these abstract formal. So the concrete operation is that school age type of level of children, okay? They're getting more logical. So they know, you know, like um, putting colors together, like when they get dressed. I look cool because I've got a blue shirt and a blue is in my um, shorts too. So it's starting to be able to organize and do those things. That is that concrete operations. Now history and physicals. Um, I got two more chapters here. <clears throat> HIPAA, remember HIPAA. One of the important things to remember with children is if the child is 18 years old, they if they're alert and aware, they can sign their own consents. <clears throat> Another thing, the parents can't get information unless the child says they can have it. Now, many times these parents are like, you better say okay, right? <laughs> I want to know the information. But by law, we don't have to give it if the child doesn't want to give it. So what are the things we have to be concerned about? <clears throat> now, <clears throat> communicating with parents. Now, number one, you need to find out who you're talking to. Is it the parent or was this kid at the aunt's house all weekend? So they know what went on with the kid and the parent doesn't. Who's going to speak for the child? Because you don't want to say, so did he take a pill? All right, so when did he take it? Okay, and when did the fever start? No, just talk to the parent. Always be aware of that culture. You know, being concerned, you know, like remember having a boila involved in this and, you know, teaching her very, you know, she doesn't even realize she's being taught with it, but you're teaching all of them, you know, about the colds and the fevers, et cetera, you know, and using silence. You know, one of the things that kids, when they finally got to me in an emergency room, I know they've had several nights of no sleep. I know that they've, you know, had to work and, and then awake all night long and they're exhausted. And I always will mention, wow, this kid's been sick. He must be exhausted, you know, and just saying that makes a parent feel like, oh, she understands. You know, because it's hard being a parent and, you know, staying up all night and working and doing everything you have to do. So uh, one of the things that I always will. One of the things is, you know, using an interpreter. If you don't understand the language completely, you need to get somebody who can. 
understand for you. And it cannot be a family member. The family member will put in their own feelings. So always do it, you know, with an interpreter, whether it's another staff member, et cetera. Communicating with children, as I said, first get down on their level. You know, um, use all sorts of um, techniques. You could do distraction techniques. I had a pocket full of stickers, girl stickers, boy stickers, you know, and stickers would make the world go round for children. You know, um, playing little games. Um, where's your ears? Where's your tummy? Uh, where's your left toe? And whatever, just it, when you make it more fun, the kid's not going to be threatened with you. As I said, find out who the person is you're talking to. And another thing, why are they here this time? You'll have some parents on an eight-year-old kid tell you what happened from birth. You don't really need that. It was just basically a normal delivery. Um, find out if they're eating. Any allergies? Do they have any medicines? And then a very important question is, are they up to date with their immunizations? If you have a young kid who is an upper respiratory with a fever and they've had no immunizations, it could be something very dangerous. You know, so we really like pertussis, right? So we need to know that. The one thing about children, every time they go to the doctor, ER, urgent care, they get their height and their weight. Adults, we don't do that, do we? Why do we do it for children? We want to make sure they're growing the way that they should be growing. Is it too much or not enough? Do we need to decrease food or do we need to give them more? Very important because remember, you need to fuel the tank properly and they need the nutrition. That's why. And know what their habit is, especially if they're being admitted. If that little... Um, Giraffe stuffy toy keeps them quiet. Make sure that if the parent has to run home or whatever, you know where that giraffe stuffy toy is so that you can have that kid calm down because sometimes it's the only thing that will do it. As a kid gets older, you know, getting a sexual history, you can have parents walk out of the room, um, ask them to leave to get histories. Um, a lot of uh, adolescents will not discuss that in front of parents. You wouldn't have me talking about that in front of my parents at that age because, you know, I would be grounded for life. Uh, but you can have uh, the parents leave and you do not have to tell them what they said unless it is something that's going to hurt them or others. OK, so you can get that information. One of the things I like to ask is these children is, so how are you doing at school? A's and B's, B's and C's, or what's your favorite subject? What don't you like? And it sort of makes you understand the child and how to speak with them. Um, again, you know, mostly children, you're not going to be able to do a head to toe like an adult assessment. You do a focused review first. They come in with upper respiratory especially a young kid, if they're in the mother's arms, I'm going to listen to the lungs first in the mother's arms because then I can hear it, okay? Make sure we understand um, how they're eating. And again, cultures, some cultures don't eat meat, vegetarians. We have to make sure that they're getting proper nutrition. Uh, thinking about things like iron um, anemia, right? If they don't have enough iron, they could have, you know, anemia because of that. As I said, head to toe never happens. <laughs> Rarely on these children, you get it as you can get that. And, you know, the one thing um, being them able to even sit for these things is getting on their level, you know, um, getting them calm. Um, you build up this relationship and then children will let you do whatever. You know, again, I let them play with the equipment. I let them push the buttons. I'll do a blood pressure on me first. Let them push the buttons, all of this stuff. And it does help. So always prepare them and be honest. 
it's going to hurt a little, let them know. Don't say, oh, it's never going to hurt because now you've lied and that's all they're going to remember for them. Um, and again, depending on the age. Growth measurements, as I said, head uh, circumference on infants is done. You know, every shift we're looking for maybe a hydrocephalus. Um, if they're premature, we want to be checking their abdomens before they feed to make sure they're feeding properly. Uh, taking a pulse, we're going to be taking mostly apical pulses on those younger children. We're not doing radial. Some book says two years, some says five years. I just do apical pulses on everybody. And I'm also listening if there's going to be any murmurs or anything going on. Blood pressure cuffs come from size double zero to extra large. It'll fit on a finger like this. Well, actually, it wouldn't like this. You know, premature babies, and they do give accurate blood pressures. So as you're going to go pick a blood pressure cuff, you sort of have to know what one to pick, right? Because it's not one for all like it is with adults. You know where to put it. Lymph nodes, children shouldn't have any if they are well. Only when they're sick do they show. You know, you look at their ears, their lungs, your gut in. Most of the time, looking first and then touching. We can see if they're breathing hard, if they're retracting. The abdomen, we're going to see if it looks loopy or distended. And then we'll, you know, do auscultation palpation. And some infants are born with two types of genitalia, male and female. Some are born with fused, uh, end up little girls can have fused labias. You know, so making sure that we're inspecting these things. You know, we checked if they have to have an anus. Some children are born without it. Um, looking at their backs, their movements, you know, looking at um, the way that they're walking. Are they, you know, wobbly? Are they got good gait? Depending on their ages, of course. You know, and then looking at the reflexes. As I said, head, chest, abdominal circumferences, they're done for different reasons. You know, all of the newborns, premature, does the head and the abdominal circumference at least once a shift, if not abdominal circumference for every type of feed that we're given. Now, you think putting a kid this age underneath that thing to get their height is easy? It is not. They think that piece of wood's coming down is going to bop them and it's going to hurt them. So I've got to do it myself first. And now I'm going to play a game because usually right next to it is a number. I'm like, look, I'm a number seven. What's your number going to be? Here, you hold it for me. Tell me when you feel it. So I've taken about one minute more time. And guess what? I'm going to get an accurate height because it's important. Height and weight. It's looking at thyroid. It's looking at growth hormones. It's looking at so many things. We want to make sure we get a good height and weight. As I said, blood pressure cuffs, we're going to do it and we could do it anywhere. The D I like to do on your toddlers and your preschoolers. It doesn't seem to bother them. Have you had blood pressure cuff on your upper arm? It pinches, it hurts. Put it on their lower leg and it's not as bad um, to get the blood pressures. But cardiac, we're going to put it on all four extremities. And the last of all is uh, pain management of children. Now, when I first started in pediatrics, we really didn't look at pain. It was something like, ah, they don't hurt. They're too young. They're not going to remember. And we were so wrong. So why? Why are they in pain? Well, the kid's not going to tell you they're in pain because they don't want a shot. They're afraid you're going to hurt them. So they don't want to admit it. Okay. So we need to say, but then why aren't you moving? You know, let's just get up. And you're going to see, oh, they hurt. So making sure that we give them their medicine um, and letting them know what's going on, making sure we're giving proper doses and that, you know, we don't wait long in between. And then, of course, going back and making sure that it um, helps. Now, a two-year-old can't tell you from zero to 10, what is your pain? Can they? No. Well, you're going to see three um, of these things used. 
we're going to see wall baker faces in numeric. I've put a couple more in here to show you, but I'm going to go through and tell you what I want you to remember of it. Now, numeric is for children eight and older, according to the book. Have I used it in younger children? Yes, that's zero to 10, zero is no pain, 10 is the worst in the world. Now, flack on the bottom here. It's the faces, the legs, the our movement, the activity, cry, and consolability. This is for children that are under three, under three or nonverbal. It could be an 18-year-old cerebral palsy nonverbal child. We can use a flax scale on, okay? And then the other one is faces. Faces is this one right here. And it's something that I carried around on my badge. And I said, look, there's a smile. She don't hurt. And look at the one there. And they got a big, sad face and tears. And they hurt more than anything. Tell me which one you feel like. And you'll be surprised. Faces is started at preschooler, age three. Before that, it's flack because they can't tell you. All right. Let's see what else we got here. <clears throat> so there's all different sort of pains, you know, the chronic and the, the recurrent. Be careful with uh, pain because some children, as I said, won't tell you. And then you have, again, cultural differences. Um, ever have a Hispanic boy who, let's say, broke his wrist? and it's swollen and it hurts and we want to give him something and daddy says i oh, suck it up yeah it doesn't hurt you'll be fine and you're like uh sir we're going to be putting a cast on and we need to give him something to help him remember there are some that will suck it up because they're they're the man they, they're, they're the boy they, they shouldn't complain and you do see it in all different cultures Remember, there's just not pain medicine. Now, pain medicine, we can give morphine, is the oldest, safest drug to use on any age, child or adult. We give it according to milligrams per kilogram. And this makes sure they're getting a proper dose. Now, we can also give the acetaminophen and ibuprofen in between. Absolutely, if it's warranted um, to get them going. We can also do a distraction. I've seen distraction part of my dissertation. Music. Um, it could also be um, coloring, um, bubbles, uh, iPads, anything that keeps their mind away from focusing on the pain. You know, and kids love to play. But let them play. Another thing about pain management is the younger children. As I said, the mouth relieves stress. They explore the world through their mouth. Another thing we can do is give them a non-nutritive sucker, a pacifier, right? They suck on it and it relieves their stress. At Nicholas, we have this little liquid we put on there called Sweeties, and it's a little sugar water. And we put it on it and they suck it. They actually did my son, my grandson's circumcision with just a pacifier with the little sweeties. He cried a little bit only because he was strapped down. And as soon as he was taking up, he was fine and never cried again. And then have you ever heard of kangaroo care? It's skin to skin. We've seen these little premature infants in the warmers and the isolates and they're just, you can't get them comfortable. Take them out, put them on mom, intubated, you know, central lines, it don't matter, on her bare chest, and that baby's heart rate will go way down, and that baby will sleep. It is the most wonderful thing to watch. And as I said, there's all things we can use for pain. Remember hot, cold, repositioning, elevate the head of the bed, bend the knees, all of these things can help, okay? If we don't treat pain, what's that kid going to remember about the hospitalization? I was at the hospital. I hurt. Nobody did nothing. I don't want to go back and I don't want to hurt again. 
why is that little girl smiling? And what is that thing on her arm there? They put a little bit of numbing cream there and a little Tegaderm on top, and it's gonna numb the area. And they're gonna come back and draw blood and she's gonna feel touch and no pain. And she's had it before. And that's atraumatic care and remembering those things. We do those for IVs and everything now, given numbings for stuff. Pain can be due to anything. You know, I think burns is the worst to deal with, but everything, remember there's pain, remember to always evaluate it. You know, it could, I mean, kids, their tummies hurt, their heads hurt, you know, and then of course we get to the point where we have those sickle cells where they're coming in in crisis and they hurt and we're gonna be giving morphine to them um, to help them with the pain. And of course, we don't want to talk or think about it, but children do get cancer and some of them die at a young age. And the one thing I want to tell you about that is because I've worked with a lot of newborns and older children that died on my watch when I was on duty. And I would cry with the parents too. It is not that the child died. What did you do for the child and the parents when they were alive? That's what makes a difference. I have been friends with parents for over 20 years, their children died. And on every nurse's week or my birthday in Facebook, you're going to see to Chris's best nurse, favorite nurse ever, we love you and thank you forever and ever for all you did. And all I did was be a nurse. And I played with them every day, okay? So which of the following is an important factor to consider in understanding the pain experience in children? Uh, B? Absolutely. They're not going to tell you because they don't want to get a pinch, right? All right. So it's 942. We actually have some time to do a coat. I'll do it quicker, all right? Have you ever played a Cahoots before? Go to Kahoot.it. Um, excuse me, the answer was B, you said? For what? Yes, what yes, yes, yes. It was, they're not going to admit to the pain because they don't want the taste of the medicine or they don't want the shot. So okay. you're going to go to Kahoot.it on your phones and on your computers, you're going to see the answers and the colors and you'll push the color on your phone. You're going to enter the game pin 8839388. I will send you the codes along with the recordings, you'll get everything. You will see two announcements from me every week. I don't like to send a lot of them because you have three classes. You don't wanna be overwhelmed. You're gonna have like week one information. It'll tell you what's due, what we're covering. Week one, recordings will be the cahoots. I'll repost the PowerPoint and I will uh, post the recording, my YouTube channel where it's at. And I usually do it right after class. This will be done tomorrow morning. Okay. Any questions? Did I put you to sleep yet? <laughs> I know it's hard this late at night. It's that long days. And you are 203. <clears throat> Week one, it goes quick. From a worldwide perspective, the infant mortality in the United States. You know, we're the greatest country in the world, right? Infant death, mortality, that means in the first year of life. I've seen a lot of changes being done, but remember, it's high. 
as comparative to other nations. Remember I told you? Switzerland, I believe, is one of the lowest um, that they have a very low infant mortality. Let's go to Switzerland, right? The leading cause of death from unintentional injuries in children is, what did I tell you about injuries? What is the most common of all injuries in children? I said any age. <coughs> And that's your motor vehicle fatalities. I have actually seen quite a few children come into the ER on a trauma alert, because I was a trauma nurse also, where somebody, next door neighbor, the aunt, the father, ran over children. I've seen good outcomes and I've seen not so good outcomes. Which statement is most descriptive of pediatric Family-centered care. What is family-centered care all about? <clears throat> Why is a family important, right? It's the constant, it's what they have, it's all they know. And especially the younger children, as they get older, they meet other families. But the one thing that's always constant is family. The major cause of death for children older than one year is. And it's not intentional injuries. I mean, kids get into things, they climb up things, things fall on them, they, you know, motor vehicles, all of this. It's unintentional. It's something that they didn't look for, it just happened. Because kids get into everything. The nurse caring for the child in pain understands that distraction. Remember pain, it's just not treating the pain. It's also trying to put that child's mind somewhere else, right? If you sit there in a room, no TV, no music, and you're in pain, what are you thinking about? My pain, it hurts, and it's getting worse. The one thing we do have to remember, again, anything that we teach a child must be on their level. Would you give an infant a sticker? It's not going to do nothing. But could you turn on music, reposition? That would work. In what type of play are children engaged in similar or identical activity without organization or a mutual goal? Remember, there's different types of play that we went over. And it went from being alone all the way up to having a goal. And it's called associative. Parallel, playing next to each other, but not sharing toys. Associative, playing together, same toys, but there's no goal. There's not a winner. Cooperative, there's a winner. It's like checkers, somebody won the game. Which statement best describes the process of critical thinking? <clears throat> You know, this is what they tell you all about nursing. You're going to learn how to critically think, right? And you think it's this almighty, what is it? Well, you go to the grocery store to buy dinner. Don't you check your cabinet, see what you have, go to the grocery store, get what you need, go home and make it. That's critical thinking. As simple as that. So it's purposeful. It's goal-directed. So you know what you want, you figure out how to get it, and you get it. What is probably the single most important influence on growth at all ages of development? Influence on growth.
nutrition, 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 nutrition. You have to fuel the tank. You have to fill it up so that it has that water and that fertilizer to grow so they can be the best they can be. Frequent developmental assessments are important for which reason? The developmental assessments, we, if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, we're identifying those delays. And what are we going to do? We're going to start early intervention. Catch those kids up really quick. I mean, a lot of times you hear that, like with speech therapy. Kids not talking, put them in speech. Within a certain amount of time, now the kid's talking. My first two grandsons did speech therapy, and they speak fine. Which function of play is a major component of play at all ages? What is play all about? I mean, a lot of these answers, you could figure it out. Remember, play they like. Play is something that they do because it's calming. It's that sensorimotor activity. They can touch, feel, play, it feels good. I want to do it. Yes, it's creative. Yes, it socializes them. Yes, it does an intellectual development because they feel good. They like it. It's all about the movement and the touch. Three children playing a board game would be an example of what? That is a goal. It's a board game. Something's going to happen. Cooperative play. Excellent. The head to tail direction of growth is referred to as what? That means first you lift your head up and then you turn over from front to back and then you get on your knees and then you crawl and then you get up on your feet and you creep and then you walk. It is called the cephalocaudal direction from head, caudal toe, head to toe. What is the single most important factor to consider when communicating with children? I mean, the first thing you need to do is get on their level um, so you're not towering over them and then get on their developmental level. And I'm not talking baby talk. I'm talking something that interests them, their T-shirt, their curly hair, their big blue eyes, whatever it is, mention something. What two-year-old pain assessment tool should the nurse use? We talked about black faces and numeric. Two-year-old. <laughs> so two-year-old is flack. It becomes faces on preschool, ages three. And then numeric is age eight. At six months, an infant birth weight should do what? <clears throat> and, you know, when we're doing these weights and it's not enough, we're going to add calories for that child. If it's too much, we might take away some calories. And we could do that very easily. We want the kids to have what they uh, need. Now, six months, they double. At one year, they triple. At two, they quadruple. So these are things that we look at to make sure they're getting the proper nutrition. The first expected fine motor developmental milestone for an infant begins with. Now, fine motor, F, is about fingers. Fingers start with a reflex palm or grasp, and then they grab the rattle. 
then they're going to take their little thumb and finger and it becomes first crude and then neat. And then we put objects in a container and build a block of two. And this is in your book. There's fine motor, F for fingers. And then there's gross motor, which is get up and go, 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 any movement, okay? Something you need to look at. There are many questions involving these developmental things, okay? An eight month old infant should be expected to perform which fine motor skills? Again, fingers, eight months old. I don't expect you to know the answers. Take a guess what you think. We start out with a reflex, you know, Palmer, and then we go to the point of building a block of two. In that, what are we going to do with fingers? So at eight months, we should be able to voluntarily grasp that rattle. And then the pincer grasp is not taking the Cheerio and putting the mouth. It's like a smoosh in the mouth. And that's what we consider a crude. The natural physical developmental sequence that most children follow is what? What do children do first? Again, we're gonna be going a lot of this over next week. I'm introducing you some really huge concepts here. They should lift their head first, roll over up on their knees, and they're going to crawl, then they're going to creep, and they're going to, or called cruise, and then they're going to walk. Usually, they're going to be taken with or without assistance a couple steps by one year old. Now, my kids never walked to 15 months, and they never walked. At 15 months, they ran 28 steps. I consider that running. Which behavior indicates that an infant has developed object permanence? What did I tell you about object permanence? What is that? <clears throat> so object permanence is, even though they can't see it, they know it's there somewhere. And what it does, it makes them go search and look for it. And then they move their muscles, which is what we want them to do. In general, an infant should triple their birth weight at what months of age? There you go, double at six months, triple at one year. Very good. Perform a head to toe assessment on a toddler, most considered to, con important to consider before beginning that exam. You're working on a toddler, ages one to three. What do you need to consider before even touching this kid? It's a very hard group to work with. You need to get on their level. And it doesn't matter if the parents are there or not, okay? Whenever you want, I mean, it does help. Don't get me wrong, but it's based it on the child's level and get on their level with them. According to Piaget, toddlers are in the blank developmental stage. Again, something I want you to look at for next week. There are quite a few questions on the first exam on theorists. So it's something I want you to get familiar with. Come with questions next week, I'll answer them. So toddlers, again, remember everything in their mouth, swapping spit, this is where they're getting sick in daycare. Think about that in the mouth, sensor and motor, it's what they like. And yes, as part to do with um, what Freud says, but Piaget um, talks about the concrete um, operations also and formal operations, figuring things out. It's in the mouth, exploring the world. 
Which intervention helps a hospitalized toddler feel a sense of control? This is the hardest group of children to have in a hospital. Very difficult for them to um, be comfortable in a new environment. And the one way that we can help them is keep them on the same routine. I mean, ever take a toddler on vacation? They're cranky. And they're cranky because they know when they're supposed to eat, when they're supposed to take a nap and sleep, and they don't get that on vacation. They don't do well with changing routines. So trying to keep them there as much as possible, bedtime the same time, bath time, trying the same foods if, if we can. All children reach developmental milestones at the same age. Yes, no. They all walk at 12 months, right? Absolutely not. They're all different. And that's why I love them. You know, adults, they're all the same. Children are not. And they challenge me. And that's why I love kids. Immunization is for a four-month-old infant. Which action should the nurse take to provide a traumatic care for this infant? What did I tell you about small infants? And, you know, what can we do so they don't feel the pain. They don't get stressed. It's all about the pacifier. They self-soothe. You know, my husband calls it a soother. And that's absolutely a great word for it because they comfort themselves with it. Which of the following immunizations can be administered to a newborn? It's the first one we give at the hospital before they leave to go home, usually. And then we start giving them at two, four, six months. And these kids get loaded up with a lot of them. And you're going to see it as you do the readings for next um, week. And it's hepatitis B. And that will give before they even leave the hospital. The normal heart rate for an infant is. Normal heart rate for an infant is 140 to 160 at rest. They can be crying. It can go to 200. And that's not concerning. That's not dehydration or, you know, that's not pain. That, that is um, absolutely normal. And we need to know that in some cases. So I'm introducing you. Think about what it could be for that age group. What is the preferred site to give an injection to an infant? <clears throat> You know, I love using that picture because that's the absolute wrong way to ever try to give an injection to an infant. I've seen children get big scratches from the needles because they'll pull it in the arm and they'll scratch it. So I would never do it. But it is the vastus lateris. Yes, it is. The death of an infant under one year old with no known cause. What is it? And when you look at this picture of this baby sleeping, what is wrong? You don't want to put them in that position, right? Yes, they must go back to sleep. Nicholas Children has had this program for 20 years going on where they have looked at it. It used to be you could be on your side too. And they said, no, that also causes SID because they um, rebreathe their CO2. So back to sleep, on their backs to go to sleep. And it's decreased the amount of SIDS death, which is what we want. We, we don't want our babies to die, period. The Vietnamese mother of a child avoids eye contact with a nurse. Considering cultural differences, why does she do that? <clears throat> she don't like looking at me? Again, look at culture. Something that you're not going to learn in one day is something you're going to learn every day you go to work. 
because all cultures are different. That is what is called respect. That's also the one that you don't touch the tops of their heads. They, that's also disrespect from you. So things, and if you don't know, you don't understand, ask the parents or ask the child. They will be so happy you did. They're never offended with it, ask. A child from Mexico is hospitalized for a serious illness and the father says the child is being punished by God. Uh, why is the dad saying that? It's just a common belief uh, with it. So again, I would say, so why do you feel that way? And they'll tell you. Which term refers to an individual's life when he or she is more susceptible to negative or positive influences. This is one of those terms that I had on the slide that I didn't really go into. So I put it on a cahoot and you'll see that sometimes I can't put it on a PowerPoint. I need to put it somewhere. So I will give you the concept in a slide. And this is one of those things. And it's called sensitive period, okay? That's part of, they're more susceptible to positive or negative for whatever reason. What is characteristic of the pre-operational stage of cognitive development, Piaget? Pre-operational. I believe this is ages like two to seven. So they have to see it to know it. They can't figure things out. That's pre-operational. So they know that if they go this way, that they're not going to get to the bathroom in Nana's house. They have to go this door to get there. They understand it. They've been there, done that. They know it. And last question. According to Kohlberg, children develop, develop moral reasoning. What is the preschooler stage of moral development? Ray says with Kohlberg, it's going to go through different things. But this is the basis of what Kohlberg says. So good or bad, and you know, and they have a consequence, and that is Kohlberg, and you'll see them all different according to different um, age groups. So we did our first scoots. Number three, Latte. Good job, Lenny. Two, Yari. Number one, KF. <laughs> and Danae and Anna. Good job, guys. So, did you like the cahoots? It sort of uh, looks at the stuff, you know, and you know what you need to understand or not. It's, you know, as you keep going through the, the different weeks, you'll see more and more, just that re-emphasis on the concepts, trying to help you understand them. So I will be sending all of this to you. Um, it'll be, again, in an announcement that'll say week one recordings. You'll have the cahoots. I'll put the PowerPoint again and the recording to my um, YouTube channel. I'm also going to put the dosage calculation stuff in there so that you can look at it, go over it if you need me one-to-one. -one. Uh, just uh, send a message to me and we'll work together to find a time that works for you because I know you guys are busy. I can fit my schedule better into yours than you can into mine, okay? So I will do that for you. It has been a pleasure. Thank you, everybody. If I can help, let me know. Again, communicate, communicate, communicate. I'll work with you. Have a good night, guys. Thank you. Good night, Professor. Good night.